Welcome to the Carveline Tech Service Podcast, the go-to industrial coatings podcast. Here are your hosts, Jack Walker and Paula Jamis. Be sure to hit like, subscribe, and set your notifications to on so you never miss any important YouTube content from Carveline. Welcome to another edition of the Carboline Tech Service Podcast. I'm Jack Walker. With me, as always, is the Director of Technical Service. That's Mr. Paula Jamis. Paul, how's it going, man? It's going pretty well. I'm getting used to this video thing, and I've learned how to not watch myself while it's recording. But I can give hand signals, and they actually have meaning now. They're just not random hand, hand signals anymore? Right. I mean, I, I am Greek. I do have a tendency to talk with my hands. I am a little bit animated from time to time. So I, I frequently do find myself trying to just, you know, hold on to something at the desk so that I don't, don't get too flaily here. But is that, that a word? For a word? I yeah. would say, is that real? Can you make that up? <laughs> Meanwhile, we have a vice president of our company just sitting there being forced to listen to this. So we might as well bring him on. Uh, we have the vice president of research and development, Mr. Jeff Anderson. How's it going today, sir? Good, guys. How are you all doing? Doing well. Good. So we kind of wanted to take the episode that we had last week and kind of expound on it. Last week, we talked about tests required for atmospheric service uh, for coatings. So we had a real generic talk about the different kind of tests that we use to preview coatings before we put them into atmospheric service. So today we want to do a similar thing, but we want to talk about the tests that we do prior to putting coatings in immersion service. So I think the first thing that we should do is define immersion service. So Jeff, do you wanna talk a little bit about uh, what qualifies a coating to be an immersion service? Yeah, I, you know, so for me in general, it, it's any coating that's going to be immersed, right? Uh, in, in a commodity, um, water, solvents, um, immersion in seawater as well, um, for extended periods of time. Mm -hmm. And that's, there that's where the coating lives. Absolutely. There's a handful of other ones that we generically throw in there as well, just when we talk about coating recommendations, and that would be coatings under insulation and uh, any kind of uh, buried uh, pipe or, or asset. So the, that would round out the full uh, immersion, uh, immersion service scenarios. definition. Yeah. yeah. And really, the reason we throw those other ones in there is they have a tendency to be wet. You know, the ground is wet when you get under insulation, unless you're working at really high temperatures, once that insulation, whatever it might be, gets wet, it's going to hold that moisture up against the surface. Surface, So all of those we consider it because once there's moisture in the area, it has a tendency to stay there. Okay, so as we think about these coatings that we're going to be putting into whatever sort of wet surfaces that it is, what kind of testing do we look at um, Generally speaking, at a high level, what kind of testing do we look to do to qualify something for this kind of service? Yeah, so it, from, from a very high level, it's pretty simple. Um, just imagine having a jar of water or solvent or whatever and putting your coated uh, substrate in there. It could be steel, could be concrete. And just letting it sit in that jar for a length of time until you think it's been uh, in there long enough, pull it out and take a look at it. So from a real high, simple level, that's the easiest way to, to test for immersion service. So if we want to know if it's resistant to water, we put it in a cup of water and we wait. Absolutely. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that really is, you know, one of the great things when I came to Carboline, came to tech service, took my first lab tour. It truly is amazing. The, the hundreds and hundreds of jars that are literally just sitting there with coated we call them coupons, but coated panels uh, in those in those containers, you know, whether it be at a high temperature, at a low temperature, whatever it is, it's just there's hundreds of jars with panels in them. Correct. And, you know, an and even simpler way to do uh, quick screening is just to make little uh, hockey pucks of the resin system you're looking at. And, and again, you're throwing it into a jar, uh, letting it sit in there. Um, and usually you're looking at whether it swells up or it has weight gain, things like that. Um, again, you can, like you said, you can do it at a higher temperature, uh, but it, it's a way to screen a number of formulations relatively quickly without having to do all the application work and 
um, worry about the substrate corroding underneath or anything like that. Just looking at the true chemical resistance of the, the coating system. And, you know, that was two good points that you brought up there, Jeff, was, you know, you look forward to see, did it swell? Did it blister? Did it discolor? Those are some of the properties that we're going to look at, whether it's while it's in immersion or periodically we take them out, depending on how long the test is running for. Frequently, we look at them, full test would be frequently a year, but you start looking at them just in days and weeks and you just take it out and you check it and you look for those events. Did it swell? Does it look like it's absorbing fluid? Is there blisters? And we evaluate all of those uh, attributes to determine, does it look like it's going down a good path? If this was on the inside of a tank or under insulation, would this be an acceptable performance um, for, for what we're looking at out of a coating? Correct. And, and that's usually early stage work. So the guys and, and the gals in the lab just trying to figure out which way to go. You know, when we get to doing the more advanced uh, testing, that's when we are closer to having a finished product, right? And when to get some good data that uh, is accepted by the industry. Right. So let's take a look at some of that data or the, some of that testing. So if you look at any of our product performance summaries that uh, give you some of that immersion data, what you see normally listed is a modified NACE TM0174 uh, listed as the test. Do you kind of want to... Uh, give us a little bit uh, more to that, or is that still just basically our, our jar with our substrate in it? Yeah, it, 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 in a way, if you if you're looking at the, I think it's test method B, correct? The uh, mm-hmm. Atlas cell. Um, in general, that can be just very similar to the jar test. Uh, you can do some more more advanced things. You can actually. Uh, simulate a cold wall like a tank that's uh, not insulated right um, and understand uh, what's happening to the coating when one side of the of the substrate is cool and the other side is is heated to a certain temperature um, in the atlas cell you can uh, although i don't think we do it here very often but you can go to higher pressures um, and simulate a, a higher pressure system in there as well so again simply you're just exposing the coating to whatever commodity you're looking at um, just like the jar, but a little more um, science to it and a little more uh, bells and whistles or switches or levers you can pull to um, torture the coating even more. So we'll use this as an opportunity to put up a picture of what an Atlas cell test looks like. But basically, you imagine you have a te- testing apparatus uh, that has two plates that are coated on either side of it uh, with uh, the solution inside or or basically a round tube that gives you a liquid and gas phase as a part of that test. Yep. Yep. So the fact the fact you can take a start taking a look at the gas phase and how that affects the coating because obviously you have uh, molecules that are much more active in the gas phase and can penetrate and and cause different uh, types of damage if you will. And you know and Jeff also mentioned that we do some occasionally some high pressure testing and that's another really neat setup to do, uh, you know, to watch it happen when you're, when you're pressurizing a chamber to just see the difference in the dynamics of how those, whether it be liquid molecules or gas molecules interact with the coating surface uh, when it's under pressure. It's a whole new set of, of dynamics that are involved there. Correct. All right, guys, I want to talk to you about Phenoline Tank Shield. This lining is designed for the internals of tanks, valves, and pipes. It is good in a wide range of chemical commodities. It's good for potable water. It's good for fuels, oils, all of those services. It is incredibly great for You get plural component performance out of a single leg product that's huge, and it doesn't have any solvent in it. So that's the Phenoline Tank Shield, guys. You definitely need to check it out. So... I guess that kind of brings us to when we're looking at these uh, immersion linings, um, what what types of resins would we normally be looking at as far as, you know, generically, what types have a tendency to, to lend towards immersion services? Predominantly, you're, you're mostly going to find epoxies. Uh, you're going to see some Novolax, some things like that. Um, those are going to be your more robust systems because they cross-link to a higher uh, level, if you will. Um, So they make a really, really tight film. So it eliminates the chance for water or solvents to uh, penetrate the film and start causing problems. 
Absolutely. So when we look at these, you know, you said earlier something about um, that we, we test for a year a lot of times when, when we go in an immersion. What's the benefit to that extended time that we, we give those tests? It's, uh, you know, there's a lot, and I know you guys talked last week because uh, Jack made me listen to the episode. <laughs> um, but uh, there are a lot of test methods that we call accelerated, right? So they um, give us a picture of how long a, a coding will last. And, you know, nothing that we do accelerated really uh, matches reality. Um, but in the case of immersion, um, there's nothing we can really do to accelerate it in my mind, because whatever you do is going to cause a different effect or potentially a different mode of failure on the coding. Um, so the, really the only way to do it is to put it in a jar and let it sit and see what happens. Normally we will start to see failures between three and six months. And typically uh, if something makes it past six months, the risk of it failing at, at a year is, is greatly reduced. Um, not enough to let us only test for six months, but um, uh, so it does give us a better picture of reality. So if something's going to last a year, um, the coding has been in that service for a while. It's, if it hasn't failed, the chances of it failing are pretty slim. And that really is an important distinction to make. Not everybody does such a long-term test. Because like you said, you start to get a good trend as to what it's going to happen, but that doesn't mean at 30 days, 90 days, 180 days, it's going to exactly be the same as it will at the end. So in order to really get a good, confident idea as to what's going to happen in an unknown scenario, you really need that longer time because honestly, the last thing anybody wants is to have gone through the expense and the liability of you know painting the inside of a tank. Yep. And having your lining system come apart, whether it be dissolve into your commodity or totally delaminate. And then now you've contaminated how many thousands of gallons of whatever that chemical is. As a coding company, we don't want to own that commodity just because it went bad and now it's our fault. So that is why we look at a, a full term test to say, how long do, do we need to see? And there are some that we've done for more than a year just to kind of let them see how they go. Absolutely correct. I mean, you know, once we get to that year mark, we may be pretty close with a, a new product to launching it and putting it out in the market, but that doesn't mean we stop the testing. Um, you know, uh, as, as Jack knows, he lives in marketing. It, it takes a while to get everything put together to, to get it, actually get it out there to the market on the, on the paper side of things and, and launch it. So we can usually get another three to six months on it. Um, just making us feel a little more comfortable in it and, and hopefully the applicators and the asset owners as well. Paul brought up uh, something uh, very mi minute, and, uh, but it's actually kind of huge when it comes to immersion service. He, he kind of briefly talked about product purity. And uh, I thought, you know, we talked about, you know, we put these uh, coupons in a jar, we put them in Atlas Cell, uh, and that, you know, one way swelling is one way that we've, but we also look at the chemical uh, itself, the, the color it started, the color it ends up, because uh, that could be an indicator as well as whether or not a product is suitable for service. Absolutely. And, you know, you can get into potable water where we send things off for, for NSF test, testing, right? So, um, and that's exactly what they're looking at is, is what has come out of your coating um, and uh, is now living in the water. Um, but as you get into more specialized chemical commodities, acids, uh, corn syrup, um, you know, a number of things, you can't have anything leaching out of your coating and, and causing issues. That's right. Especially when we're talking about, you know, food, cosmetics, drugs, anything like that. You don't want something if we're going to be consuming it. You know, we, we do our best as a coatings company to make sure that it's safe to be put into those. We subject it to third party testing you know, depending on what the chemical, what the chemical is, you know, who's going to be reviewing that information. Yeah, correct. And, and it is a big liability and one we take seriously. So that's right. Ab absolutely. So now we've, we've been kind of been talking about evaluating coatings for uh, what I'll say is static immersion service where there's, uh, you know, you have a tank, you have your um, chemical, there's not a lot going on. But every now and then, we have immersion scenarios where there's high particulate matter and uh, undissolved solids that can create 
uh, abrasion or even high turbulence or flow can cause erosion or, or harder factors on a coating. So how do you evaluate that when you're dealing with immersion grade coatings? Yeah, um, you, you know, you can do it in, in a number of different ways. In, in, uh, in my past, what I've done is I've actually done immersion followed by abrasion. Um, a lot of times you can do um, um, adhesion testing as well to understand. Um, but just to just torture the coating in, in many ways, any way you can think of to simulate the environment that's going to be into. You're right, some of these, uh, you know, on the wastewater side of things, uh, you hear stories about shopping carts getting into the system, right? Uh, let alone, you know, whatever else can fit down a storm drain, which is, is quite large, right? Yeah. Um, and it, it's turbulent, it's, it's aggressive, and it can really cause damage if you're not careful. And yeah. that, that really is the key. You know, just, be, just once you put it into um, immersion service, doesn't mean, or immersion testing, doesn't mean that we're done with the test necessarily. Right. Like Jeff said, we'll, we'll take it out. We'll do abrasion testing on it after it's been immersed. We'll do adhesion testing on them. And all of those are to try to give us the maximum performance and the chemical will change those results. Yes, it will. I really feel like we missed our opportunity. We talked about storm drains to talk about clowns and paper boats and children, but uh, <laughs> we'll just not we'll just not go there. And and I think this is a good place to wrap it up. Uh, but you know, just to kind of summarize, it's it's not as you know, I don't want to oversimplify it and make it sound like the work that our chemists do is, isn't rocket science, but at the same time, it's very logical. So when you think about the uh, immersion in like sulfuric acid, well, we, we immerse a coating in sulfuric acid to make sure it'll work. So um, I hope you guys got something out of this. Jeff, thank you very much for coming on and joining us. Thanks, Paula. <laughs> touchdown and with that i'm jack and that's paula and we're out of here <laughs> <laughs>